Hello everyone. So uh, thanks for the lovely introduction and the invitation. Um, more or less uh, what I wanted to talk about today was kind of using this longitudinal data to look at social media use as, as part of this seminar. And it was really difficult in this time when um, we're all very busy in kind of very different ways from kind of just a month ago uh, to think about how best to structure this. So what I thought I would do is um, kind of take you through my own personal journey using large scale longitudinal data sets uh, to answer these questions to kind of show kind of how my thinking has developed over time and my use of these data sources has developed over time. Um, and this will hopefully cater to the diverse audience that we have from people who work mainly with the data sets um, and who know them very well to those who are maybe more interested in the questions um, because it kind of takes a bit of, of all of these things. Do excuse some of my slide formatting. I think one of the most difficult things of moving institution is not the physical movement of me and my family and all my office furniture, but the movement of my slides into a new format uh, and a new template. Um, they're still getting there. So um, there are some which will look a bit wonky. Uh, just, just kind of gloss over that. So I'll go through four phases of my, you know, thinking around social media use and large-scale longitudinal data and that should take about 30 minutes so uh, what got me interested in these questions then a phase where I mainly thought about kind of longitudinal data as too big to fail and what that means and how I try to address that then my move to actually analyzing things longitudinally um, naturally this was a time I've also grown as a researcher and the, the kind of approaches I've used have changed uh, and now my current thinking around highlighting individual differences and why that's really important. So phase one is, is why this topic? Um, I already researched social media use as an undergrad for my undergrad project, but mainly around personality and, and social media use and trying to predict personality from social media data. Um, and then I moved to the University of Oxford to do my PhD and I was actually mainly interested in questions I'm being asked now in the last two weeks, kind of how is social connection over an online medium different to social connection face to face? What does one click interactions like likes mean? Um, how do we build relationships when it's over a digital medium? And I did some studies on that, but it's actually really difficult to study if you um, don't have access to the actual social media platforms. Most of my studies were quite crude experiments uh, and coming from my actually study natural sciences with a um, focus on physics and maths, I was actually not a very good experimentalist. Um, and so I was kind of lost in the second year of my PhD. That was 2017, the end of my second year, um, was when the kind of debate around social media use and mental health really reached a climax. Um, Jean Twenge, who's a professor at, on the West Coast of the United States, published a book called iGen, uh, which linked social media and smartphones to the current mental health crisis in adolescence. Um, the minister, health minister, uh, Jeremy Hunt at the time, link you see on the slides on the left, linked social media to being as great of a threat to children as obesity. Uh, people were linking social media and smartphone use to, to drugs, hard drugs like cocaine. And the UK Parliament started actually actively looking into the link uh, with an inquiry uh, in the House of Commons Select Committee. Um, and then I think now there have actually been four inquiries in total. But what got me especially interested and kind of hooked on this was this article, which was actually the most popular science article in the Atlantic of 2017. So Jean Twenge, who was writing this book, used it to kind of postulate the theories uh, that she will publish her book about just weeks later. Um, and this, in this, it's titled, Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? And I've just cut out one of the paragraphs where she said that psychologically, however, they, so the current generation of adolescents, are more vulnerable than millennials were. Rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed since 2011, 
it's not an exaggeration to describe iGen, so this current generation of adolescents, as being on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades. Much of this deterioration can be traced to their phones. So the last sentence is the most interesting because it actually makes a causal statement. It says that we can trace these trends in teenage mental health back to the invention of the iPhone in, in 2007. And that's, this is what got me interested in, and Jean Twenge wrote her book reliant on large scale longitudinal data sets, mainly in the United States. For example, this was one of her first papers uh, that fed into her book published also, sorry, I've got an eyelash in my eyes, so I keep on touching it. <laughs> um, but the, she published this in 2017 and again, linking depressive symptoms to increases in new media screen time using the monitoring the future data set and the YRBSS data set as well, um, but all US based. And when this came out, I got sent this by a journalist to comment on, and I realized that all this data was openly available. So I could go and actually have a look myself. And that's really what started off kind of my academic career in this area. Because overnight when I was working through this data set, this is what I found. So still quite rudimentary graphing skills I had in 2017. Um, but you have social media use on a one to five scale at the x-axis, depressive symptoms on a one to five scale on the y-axis. And this is the correlation that this paper is based on um, and that feeds into the book. Uh, and it is actually a significant positive correlation between social media use and depressive symptoms. Uh, the line is actually very slightly positively inclined. But for me, this seemed absolutely tiny. And as a grad student, this is kind of where I started to realize statistical power actually does exist. And you know, if you have large data, uh, very small effects do become statistically significant. And while I've read about that a lot, it's actually when you start realizing it yourself while working with data or simulating data now that is what I do now, uh, that you can really start feeling that, that power of these large scale data sets and, and how they also cause problems. Furthermore, I started reading a lot of the previous work done on the, not the Millian Co study, but the monitoring the future uh, survey in the United States. And it has about 12 different questions that relate to well-being. And I've listed, the, listed them on this table in the columns. So, for example, on the very left, you have, I take a positive attitude towards myself. While on the very right, you have, how happy are you these days? And all adolescents get asked these questions in this data set year on year. Um, and these are actually two different pre-existing questionnaires. So on the left, you have um, the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. On the right, there's a well-being scale. And, but if you look through the rows, the rows are actually all these different studies that have used these questionnaires. Um, and you see that a lot of them have picked and chosen certain items instead of using the pre-existing questionnaires. And so, especially when psychologists, I think because we're not as trained in using these resources as, for example, economists um, or epidemiologists, have gone into these data sets, they often disregard the kind of structure of the questionnaires and seem to be pick and choosing the question that they analyze. Um, and this creates a lot of opportunity for analytical flexibility, which then uh, really took two years of my academic life to kind of work through and, and to try to find how I can express these worries I started to get about the garden of working paths. And so the garden of working paths um, is really this flexibility that we have when we analyze data, if it's small or large, um, in how we pick and choose, for example, what questions we analyze, or if we exclude outliers, or if we uh, include um, a transformation. But it's heightened by large-scale data. Um, and this led me to think about these longitudinal large-scale data sets as data that is, quote-unquote, too big to fail. It's on the one hand, because they have so many participants, which means that even very, very small associations or effects become statistically significant. 
and they have these large batteries of many questions because so many different disciplines use them because they're so costly to run. But that often means that they're ill-defined or that researchers don't take the time to read through all the manuals uh, to figure out what the questionnaires actually are, which leads to this explosion of different ways to analyze the data. And that this is actually really problematic. So that led me to kind of phase two, <laughs> where I tried to start figuring out what, what I was actually putting my finger on. What are these problems? And just to go back to the Garden of Working Paths, um, this was this name uh, is really well described by Andrew Gelman, a uh, statistician at Columbia in New York, um, in one of his blog posts I linked to below. But when we analyze data, it's not like uh, when I got taught this as an undergrad, it felt like statistics is like a magnifying glass and it's a magnifying glass I can hold to the data and then the data it shows me the information that the data holds but actually statistics is very different in that we need to make so many different decisions while we apply it to the data to actually get the end result and all these decisions that we make can have a really important effect on what we actually find at the end and these decisions are for example um, whether to include or exclude certain outliers and we could do that in multiple different ways once we've done that we need to decide for example how to measure well-being do we use a questionnaire do we add certain questions from another how do we define this and the same maybe in my area it's how do we define digital technology use or, or social media use uh, what participants do we include and then what covariates do we, do we include as well? And these are actually a huge amount of decisions that we have to make. And if we make them while analyzing the data, we might be slowly inclined to go down a certain path of analyzing the data that leads us to the thing that might confirm our hypothesis or the statistically significant result. Um, this could be unconscious or conscious. Um, I think mostly unconscious really. So what we have in a paper is, a report of the statistical methodology, which is kind of like the red path. So all the decisions we made to get to that end result, which was statistically significant. But there is this secret world of all of these different ways the data could have been analyzed. And some of them might have also become statistically significant. Some of mine then might have been left statistically insignificant. Um, but not knowing what this alternative world is, is it makes it difficult to judge how confident we should be in this, this result that is reported. And this is not, you know, this, is, this has been part of the psychological conversation for almost a decade now. Uh, this is my all-time favorite paper, I think. Uh, Simonson, Simmons, Nelson, and Simonson in 2011 wrote this paper called False Positive Psychology, which is really a wake-up call to psychologists about these issues. Um, and, the title says it all, undisclosed flexibility and data collection and analysis. So all these things we can choose, pick and choose from this flexibility I showed you in the previous slide, it allows presenting anything as significant. So they show that you can really present what you want as significant if you use a lot of these kind of flexibility that we normally have. Um, and People use this all the time. You know, I excluded certain conditions from my undergrad project um, because I was advised to by my, my kind of supervisor. And while you know it's kind of not great, because everybody's doing it, you kind of do it as well. And Simmons, Simmons uh, has a really great quote in a, in a more recent paper where he said that everybody felt this flexibility was like jaywalking you know we all do it we all think it's not great but you know it's okay but it's actually as bad as robbing a bank because it it really decreases our confidence in the results so in the last 10 years we've really gone through a way of thinking about how we can limit this flexibility and the first few steps were all about you know we need to be transparent about how we analyze things and report, for example, if we excluded outliers or transformed data. But then slowly people move to more kind of extreme changes. Uh, one of these is pre-registration. Um, probably we've all heard 
of pre-registration. It's quite a simple idea and I've, I've kind of sketched it out on the right hand of the slide. So here you again see this garden of working paths and all the decisions we need to make when we analyze our data. Um, and the problem is really if we make these decisions while we work with the data and that can bias what decision we make. But in pre-registration, the researchers' hands are tied before the data is actually collected. They note down exactly what path they're going to take through this garden of working paths. And so the actual data cannot bias uh, how they analyze the, their kind of results anymore. And so the, by deciding on this one analytical pathway beforehand, um, a lot of these problems of analytical flexibility are greatly reduced not eliminated and so it's a really simple way it's all you have to do is upload your analysis plan kind of publicly to something like the open science framework and i think that's why it's become such a popular thing we for example teach our undergrads now or encourage our graduate students to engage in and you can see that on this graph um, this was published in 2018 so this is naturally developed but pre-registrations on the OSF, the Open Science Framework, have really been increasing exponentially. Um, and registered reports, which is another format on how to engage in those, has also been kind of increasing in popularity. But this is a talk about longitudinal data uh, and kind of data sets that, for example, Closer really works with. And these are pre-existing for most researchers at least, um, if you don't wait, wait exactly for a new wave of data to be released, for example. And so the question emerges, kind of, can we really say that I haven't seen the data? Um, there's a lot of trust involved, for example, if I pre-register something for a data that I can just download off the internet, because I could have had a look or um, a colleague could have had a look and then kind of, I could have decided what pathway to take. Um, furthermore, even if I haven't touched the data myself, data sets like the Millennium Cohort Study or Understanding Society are really prevalent in a lot of the scientific literature. Uh, for example, on social media use, there are tens and, you know, 20, 30 studies published every year looking just at a single longitudinal pre-existing data set. And so even if I haven't looked at the data set itself, I've looked at the studies that have been published on it. And so I've looked at those studies analytical decisions. And so it's really kind of hard to prove that the data hasn't influenced how I've decided to analyze my data. Um, so this is kind of the problem of pre-registration if you're using pre-existing data. And a lot of researchers have, there's a great paper in AMPPS on pre-registering pre-existing data. And I think it makes sense but I was trying to find a different solution. And so this brings us to solution number two, which is we could also take a different approach. So instead of tying our hands beforehand and analyzing the data in the one pre-specified way, you could also analyze all statistically and theoretically defensible ways that you could analyze the data. So as you can see on, in the image on the right-hand side, instead of analyzing one path, what if we ran and analyzed every single one of these different paths and then just reported them together? And then the reader could judge the confidence they have in the results because they see the whole range of different possible results that could have emerged in analyzing the data in slightly different ways. And this is a possibility also if you've previously accessed the data. So I got really interested in this to come to really understand how these different analytical methods affect what we find when we're linking digital technologies and well-being. And I hear I put them together. <laughs> but before I go there, I just want to talk you through a bit of the, the thinking behind this method, which is called specification curve analysis or multiverse methods. And they've been used in many different fields, but I'll just be focusing on psychology for now. And it began with the study, um, which I still remember reading in the newspaper, which showed that female hurricanes are deadlier than male hurricanes. Um, so in the United States, 
hurricanes are named alternating from male to female. Um, so, for example, in one year, your first female, your first hurricane will have a female name like Amanda. The second hurricane would be named Ben. Third hur hurricane would be named Catherine, for example. Um, and they found that hurricanes with female names seem to cause more deaths uh, using an archival study. And they link that because people would underestimate the strength of a hurricane because of kind of prejudice against females being less strong or less kind of influential. Um, so this was published in PNAS, but quickly after the study was published, a lot of commentaries started to arise. So for example, here, uh, two researchers wrote into PNAS saying that, you know, we've analyzed the data slightly differently and we, we didn't find this effect. Um, another group of researchers said that, you know, how we treat the population really matters when modeling hurricane fatalities. The third said that statistics show no evidence of gender bias in public's hurricane preparedness. While the fourth kind of with the strongest statement say that female hurricanes are not deadlier than male hurricanes. So all of these letters analyze the same archival data in slightly different ways. So now what we have is the kind of published result, which has one pathway through the garden of working path, and they report one way of analyzing the data. And then you have four others that show that if you analyze it in four different ways, you don't really find this effect exists. And while our confidence is decreasing in the initial result, there's still a lot of open questions. And this is where Simonson, Simons, and, and Nelson developed the specification curve analysis framework. So they said, you know, why don't we try to analyze the data in all theoretically defensible ways? And how they did that is that they thought about what decisions do we need to take to get from the data to the end result? Um, so, for example, you need to decide which storms to analyze. What outliers do you exclude, for example? Or you need to decide on how do we class whether a name is male or female. Uh, in the original study, for example, this classification of male slash female was done by coders. So they rated the femininity of the names on a scale from 1 to 11. But naturally, the study could have well been done by categorizing the names into male or female as a kind of dichotomous variable. And the same, for example, with covariates. The original study included a specific subsection of covariates, but you could have also included other covariates. And so what they wrote is, is this table that I present on the slide where they show that for all these five decisions, the original study, so the middle column, made a specific kind of choice, but there were also alternative choices, alternative specifications, as they say. And what you can do with a table like this is you can actually run every single combination of these choices. Um, and so analyze the data in all these different possible ways. So this is the kind of graph they ended up with, and we don't really need to worry about it, um, the kind of bottom messy part. I'll talk you through that kind of with my own study. But at the top, um, and I still haven't really figured out if people see my cursor, but in the green, in the kind of darker green section, um, all these little blue dots are actually different ways of analyzing the data. And they form this line from those at the very left that show kind of no extra deaths or actually that male hurricanes are more deadly to those at the very right, which showed kind of higher extra deaths for female hurricanes. So actually some analyses found that male hurricanes were more deadly um, kind of here on the left, while um, there were quite a few that showed that analytical pathways that showed that female hurricanes were more deadly. But only those in black were statistically significant. So there are only actually very few of these analytical this pathways that show the statistically significant result, which severely decreases our kind of uh, confidence in this study finding. Okay, enough <laughs> statistics, um, enough kind of garden of working paths. Uh, and from, from now on, I'll just take you through 
uh, the work that I've been doing. Um, but I think it's important to see that this is the first few studies that I'll present now were mainly there to show this problem of analytical flexibility uh, in this area that I sit in and the problem of small effect sizes. So the first study um, was a kind of direct commentary on the study I presented earlier by Gene Twenge that uh, analyzed the YRBS survey and the MTF. And what I did is analyze those two data sets and the Millennium Cohort study here from the, the UK. And as the previous authors have done, I looked mainly at the correlation between digital technologies and adolescent well-being. So I'll present some of the results, for example, from the Millennium Cohort study. Here on the graph, I present 20,000 different ways of analyzing the data on the x-axis and the regression coefficient, which kind of shows the correlation between digital technology use and well-being on the y-axis. Um, and so here you see that actually 10,000, about a bit more than 10,000 study, uh, sorry, I'll start again a bit more than 10,000 ways of analyzing the Millennium Cohort study showed a negative correlation between digital technologies and well-being. This is because, as you see here, it goes from one to kind of 10,000 different ways of analyzing the data, and they were all kind of underneath the y-axis in the negative part of the graph. However, there are also 5,000 ways of analyzing the data that would have showed a positive correlation. So showing that digital technology is actually is kind of related to higher well-being in those teenagers. And another 5,000 showed a non-significant effect. So here there's, there's nothing really to see. Um, so on average, which is a dotted line, we do get a negative correlation and that is quote unquote statistically significant in a very complicated simulation process. Um, but it does show that there is a huge range of possible outcomes and it's really important for people to specify beforehand how they're analyzing the data because of this really large range. Um, sorry. The, um, what we see as well is that the effect sizes are really small. Um, so the correlation is under 0 0.1, which means that kind of in percentage variance explained, if you know the amount that of digital technology used, it only predicts uh, less than 1% of the variance in well-being in these teenagers. And what I try to do um, is to show how small this correlation is by comparing it to things that I, to kind of relations of activities to well-being that I know the activities should be positive, where I knew the activities should be negative, and where I knew the activities should probably have no correlation with well-being. And in this graph, in panel B on the right, I compare the relationship between technology use and well-being, which is the purple bar, which is showing a very small um, kind of negative regression coefficient with, for example, how whether you're left or right-handed relates to well-being in the Millennium Code study, uh, where you see it's very close to zero. Um, bicycle use and height actually have a positive correlation, which is very small, and wearing glasses has a negative correlation, which is also very small, but actually a bit bigger than digital technology use. And while this isn't, um, you know, I've, I've really developed my thinking around this in the last couple of years, and do ask me about why I don't think this is the best way of displaying the data. But this was very popular at the time, um, so I thought I should present it here. Um, and it, what it should show us is that, one, correlations don't really tell us anything, and two, the correlations that we're looking at between digital technologies and well-being are actually very, very small. So this is summarized here. So this study shows that there seems to be a negative correlation between digital technology, digital technology use and well-being. And it does seem to be statistically significant and, and I've found that repeatedly, but it's very, very small. And the question for me really arose, is it worthy of this intense public debate I was inhabiting in 2017, where you know, the health minister was saying that 
digital technologies and social media are worse than obesity for children. So the, the work really developed. Um, so in another study, I actually took three different data sets, one from Ireland, one from the United States, and one from the UK. So again, the Millennium Cohort study to look at um, digital technology use, both during the day, which is self-reported, like we kind of in the study before, the kind of adolescents report on how much they use technologies, but also based on um, time use diaries. So where they note down what they're doing at the end of the day and kind of every 15 minutes, for example. And there we can also look at kind of when did this use of digital technologies take place? Example, it, was it before bedtime or was it spread throughout the day? And I combine this with actual pre-registration. So um, this is just a graph to show that um, on the very left-hand side are the analyses for the Irish data, in the middle the analyses for the American data, and I did these um, kind of beforehand, and the newest wave of the Malayan cohort study hadn't come out then. So what I did using the Irish and the American data is I figured out the hypotheses that were most valuable to answer, I pre-registered those and then I ran those on the Millennium Cohort study to kind of test, confirm my hypotheses and test them. What I found um, is that, again, there's a negative correlation. Again, we're working correlationally here still, is there's a negative correlation um, between self-reported technology use and well-being. Uh, that's the negative 0.08 beta coefficient on this table. Um, and that was statistically significant again. But if we extract technologies from time use diaries, so where they note down what they're doing in 15 minute intervals during a day, the teenagers, the negative correlation drops quite substantially. It's still significant, but it's very, very small. And actually, especially the use before bedtime uh, doesn't really seem to be related to well being. One of the kind of for two of the data sets, there was a negative relation that was significant, and then in the MCF, it was actually positive or non-significant, and um, there was nothing, not a lot to glean from that. Um, so what this kind of showed again is, yes, on, if we average across all different types of technologies and all different types of teenagers, the correlation again seems to be negative. It is significant, it is still extremely small, and it seems to be mainly driven by these kind of self-reports. So if we use self, these cumulative self-report measures where uh, we ask teenagers to kind of tell us how much they use technologies, then those normally show much more negative correlations. And just today, uh, I read a preprint um, by people in Bath, uh, which actually showed that, you know, self these self-report measures are really highly correlated with mental health and very low correlated with actually the technology use, which is kind of worthy of a whole separate talk. <laughs> okay, so we then entered phase three, um, which was mainly about moving away from these cross-sectional studies to actually using the longitudinal data for what it's worth. Um, the, the kind of two studies I just presented were mainly commentaries on the previous work that's being done showing that it's very low in quality and that we really need to do better in thinking about effect sizes, uh, thinking about kind of moving away from correlations and then treating analytical flexibility as something that really matters. So that's where I moved to working mainly with understanding society, which is still the kind of main data set I work with. Um, in this study I'll presenting here, I worked with the youth subsample of the survey, so 10 to 15 year olds, about 12,000 overall, um, but about 2,000 per analysis that I run. So in kind of looking longitudinally, uh, I work mainly with random intercepts cross like panel models to look at the relationship between the use of social media and life satisfaction across the years. Um, and while this is a complicated graph, actually the thought behind these analyses is quite simple. So, and I'll use Roger Kivitz's example around typing speed. So um, 
oftentimes when we just when we, we need to differentiate bet, what we call between person and within person effects and this is really important because they're very different so if i had a classroom full of kids well that's not happening anymore at the moment but if i would be an it teacher um, and they're typing away and i would look at the relationship between typing speed and typing accuracy across the class this is kind of like a between person correlation that's what i've been doing in my previous studies um, i would probably find um, a positive correlation between typing speed and typing accuracy that's because the kids who are just better typers type faster and are more accurate. While there are kids that are just worse typers that will type more slowly and also less accurately. But, it, and that, while it shows us something interesting, for example, if we think about the correlation between social media use and well-being, it actually doesn't tell us anything about what, what happens if one child, um, to one child if it changes, um, for example, it's, it's typing speed because if I now choose one of, one of the child and sit them down and I tell them, um, you now need to type faster, <laughs> then probably their accuracy is gonna drop. So on the within person level, there's probably a negative correlation between typing speed and typing accuracy. So if, we, if a child is increasing their typing speed, their accuracy is going to drop. And actually it's this within person relation that policymakers and parents uh, and researchers are probably the most interested in when we think about social media use and well-being. Um, the correlation across the population is, is interesting in itself, but to really, what we're really asking is, if a child increases their social media use from their own average, how is their well-being going to change, for example, in a year's time? And the Understanding Society data set allows us to look at that because what we can do for each of the children in that data set is kind of we calculate their average social media use and their average well-being and then we look at you know if in one way their social media use increases from their own average what happens to their well-being in the next wave does it decrease does it increase does it stay the same and that's what we kind of i present here um you can kind of just look at the relationships at the bottom um, on the left hand side is the correlation. So this is the between person effect that I talked about before when we're studying the whole classroom. And there we find kind of a negative correlation like we found in the previous studies. It's the same question. <laughs> um, and it's always about negative 0.1. Um, but if we look at these between person effects, so the middle column is social media use, a change in social media use, predicting a change in life satisfaction then we find smaller negative relations and all that also happens with life satisfaction predicting social media use so the kind of takeaway from that is that the between person kind of longitudinal effects seem smaller they're still negative but they're also bi-directional so it's not just social media use causing a change in life satisfaction the opposite is also the case so that takes me to the last phase, which is the phase that I'm currently in, doing kind of more complicated longitudinal modeling um, and looking at individual differences. And that's because in, these, in this study that I presented on in, in the Understanding Society data set, the relations look very different for teenage girls and teenage boys. So here, you're more or less just look at the black dots they show on the, on the left, on the y-axis are different kind of different measures of life satisfaction. So satisfaction with schoolwork, satisfaction with school, the mean life satisfaction, satisfaction with life, satisfaction with friends, with family, and with appearance. And then on the x-axis is the kind of effect of social me social media use on life satisfaction one year later. And across the board, it's very it's negative. So if a teenage girl increases her social media use in one year, her life satisfaction across most of these areas drops a bit, except satisfaction with appearance. <laughs> um, and so this was very interesting. It does show that there is a kind of longitudinal effect for teenage girls. But now if we look at 
it should move. Yeah, it moves. This is now for teenage boys. The kind of effects become a lot more, a lot smaller um, and more non-significant. So again, this is then for teenage boys and all the lines, almost all of them start moving across the kind of zero axis, meaning that they become non-significant. And the same happens in the other direction. So life satisfaction, changing social media use, there are no significant effects to boys. So their life satisfaction doesn't really influence their social media use one year later. But there are quite a few statistically significant relations for teenage girls. So for them, a drop in their life satisfaction does seem to link to an increase in social media use one year later. So this is only really the start. <laughs> We've not really looked at gender effects at all. And it, it, yeah, it's really just the start of a bigger research program, hopefully. So what this study showed, just to summarize, is that the link between now social media use mainly and life satisfaction, again, seems to be negative. It is significant, whatever that tells us, it doesn't, and we can go into that in the questions. But it is, seems to be bidirectional. Social media effects aren't a one-way street, for example. And it seems to be gender specific. So a lot of these kind of directional effects are only significant for teenage girls, but not for teenage boys. So what I'm doing now is I, I have this four-year fellowship to look at both the Malayan cohort study and the understanding society, and both look at kind of gender and age differences, but also um, try to using kind of other approaches and looking at whether there are more important individual differences other than age or gender that predict kind of a more negative relation between digital technologies or social media use and well-being for teenagers. Um, and that is, oh, that's the last slide. <laughs> but yeah, so what I think is important and what this journey shows, if we kind of now look towards the future, is that we need to change our questions, moving away from correlations towards kind of longitudinal data analysis and thinking about the diversity of the adolescents we're analyzing. Um, I think boys and girls are just the most simplest way to partition the populations and um, there might be more important ways of, of kind of splitting them up and seeing who are the people who are, might be negatively and who are the people who might be positively affected. We need to push for more transparency still, analytical flexibility and the lack of understanding of how to use large scale longitudinal data is still very present, especially in my area. Um, and we need to get better data. I hinted at the kind of problems with self-reported social media use and digital technology use measures. And that's very, very prominent at the moment. But yeah, for now, uh, that's the end of my talk. And I'd love to hear any questions and thanks for the invitation.